Good evening, church. Welcome back for day five, part five of True Worship. I hope you have been following through. We've done four parts already. We are on day number five. And I think we've been learning so many uh, stuff about the names of God, the characteristics of God, and so many things we've learned. I hope you have been blessed. I have been blessed actually teaching this uh, to you guys as well. So I hope you're ready for day number five. And we are looking at this name. Actually, this, this day, our focus is actually the name of God is El Shaddai. And I'm sure you've heard this name. We've sung the song. It's a very... A common name, El Shaddai. So what does El Shaddai really mean? It means God Almighty, which also means the Almighty, All-Sufficient God. See, the root word Shaddai means to display power. Okay, and it, which is the first time actually the reference of the name El Shaddai in the Hebrew text comes in in Genesis chapter 17 verse 1 which is also going to be our text for today which we are going to look at right it talks about if you look at Genesis chapter 17 verse 1 it says when Abraham was 99 years old the Lord appeared to Abraham and said into said to him I am almighty God therefore walk before me and be blameless I am Almighty God. And in the Hebrew text here, it talks about, I am El Shaddai, the Almighty God. And we also see, like we, I think what is the, the week, uh, the previous week before, we talked about Moses in the burning bush. And he also knew the sovereignty of God, right? And he knew God, but he also knew God as El Shaddai, the Almighty God, right? So actually the character we're going to look at today is the credibility of God. The credibility of God, right? So our passage, so what is credibility actually? What is credibility? Is he trustworthy? You may be looking at him. Obviously, yes. But how? How is he trustworthy? He is a credible God. You can put your entire trust in him. You cannot put your entire trust in man. You cannot put your entire trust in a firm or an organization, your workplace, whatever. It, maybe your education. You cannot put your entire trust in that. But one person you can put your trust in is Almighty God, which is El Shaddai. So let's go to our passage today in Genesis chapter 17. We're looking at verses 1 to 11. Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 to 11. And it is a beautiful passage. We may know this passage, but let's read together. I hope you've got your Bibles open. You've got your books and notepads ready to write down and mark out things. We're going we're gonna to study God's Word today. This is Bible study. So I hope you are ready to study. Okay, let's go. When a Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you, and we will multiply you exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father to many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but shall be Abraham." For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make you nations of you. I will make nations of you. And kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations. For an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, throughout their 
generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh for your foreskins. And it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. So this passage is, and goes on and it talks about actually the sign of the covenant God made with Abraham. Let's close our eyes and let's pray for a moment. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this moment. We thank you for this time, Lord, that we've come together to study your word. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that as we dig deep into your word, as we start learning the characteristics of you, of El Shaddai, I pray, God, that you will re give, uh, illuminate our minds, Lord. Give us a fresh understanding of who you are. Lord, I pray that not my words, but your words, Lord, touch my tongue as I speak the oracles of you, Father God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. So, getting to this story, let's do the backdrop of this story, right? The backdrop is Abraham, Abram was 75 years old, right? His name hadn't changed to Abraham yet, so it was called Abram, right? Or people have different pronunciations. If you're saying, no, it's not Abram, it may be something else, right? So, the different people, different pronunciations. So, Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran and God asked him, to get up and leave right he was 86 years old when the son ishmael was born of hagar the servant girl he had waited some 25 years for the fulfillment of god's promise to give a son through sarai it had been about 13 years since his last recorded word from god right all this uh, why i'm giving you this time frame is for the promise of God to come to reality, there were many years Abram had to wait. See, Abram was now 99 years old when God appeared to him to make a covenant of circumcision with him. See, this passage goes on to show that God does do things according to, not according to nature's timing, but, uh, but according to his timing and the way he wants because he alone deserves all glory for everything in our lives. See, it doesn't happen to our timing. We've, I'm, I'm sure you've noticed that even in our day-to-day -day lives and uh, through our years of lives, you know, God's timing is different to our timing. We expect God to fit into our timing, isn't it? Most of it we want. We want God to work like this. When he promises something, we want to see answers. We want to see the miracles happen like this. But see, sometimes we forget that God is Almighty God. He is El Shaddai. He is El Elyon. He's beyond our timing. He's beyond the world's time. He works according to His time, the way He wants, how He wants to. That is Him. See, when certain events and answers to prayer take place in the natural, it would be hard to see the hand of God in it and the attribute and the victory to God. See, when things happen to everything the way we want to, what happens? We forget the concept of God. We just leave him out all of a sudden. See, when God takes his time and brings about the work in us, what happens? He molds us. There are things he changes in us. Time helps change us to be more like God, to appreciate Him more, to honor Him more, to love Him more. So, so as we look into this passage, and as we're gonna we're gonna study deep into this passage in Genesis chapter 17, right? And uh, so the first thing, right, in verse one, if you look at uh, chapter 17, verse one, we'll take it down. Uh, uh, one by one. See, Abraham was well advanced in years. What, what do we see? How old was Abraham? Abraham was 99 years old. Wow. 99. Right? See, God appeared to him to make a covenant of circumcision with him. You see in this that he was 99 years old. So, scientifically, you can see is what? He was at an age when procreation seemed impossible. 
There is no possibility. Another beautiful incident, if we, if we go into the New Testament, right, we would see Mary. She was too young. She had only been betrothed. But we've all heard this statement, nothing is impossible with God. And this shows, see for, for Abraham, who came to an age where procreation was impossible in the earthly manner. If we looked at it scientifically or earthly, it's impossible. But we can see it, that through God, anything is possible. Why? He made a promise. He is El Shaddai. He is a credible God. You can trust him. He is trustworthy. He is true to his promises. Whatever he says, he will do. Maybe not according to my time, but according to his time, he will accomplish whatever he has spoken. That's how much he is trustworthy. See, if you look at it, who did God say he was? And what do you understand by his character? Because he says in that verse, if we look at verse 1 again, he says, I am almighty God. That's the first thing he says to Abram. When he appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. See, God said in this verse, God talks to him in the Hebrew text, like I said, when he says, I am almighty God, he says, I am El Shaddai. He says he was God almighty. What did he mean by that? That nothing is impossible with him. He is above every situation. In other words, we cannot limit God to our abilities. Just because we cannot do something in our own strength, we don't limit God to that. God is not limited to the strength and the capacity we are. He is much bigger and He is much greater. See, sometimes we won't be able to witness the mighty power unless we let go of our weak strength and allow God to take over and intervene. See, the moment we are able to say, we are, it's, 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 it's out of my reach. The moment we are able to humble ourselves and say, you know what, this is more than what I can do. That's when God is glorified, not man. If it is every time what we can do with our strength, what happens? God does not get the glory, we get the glory. See, so long as we believe that we can do everything in our own strength and power, then secretly we begin to worship ourselves. And we see ourselves as mini-gods. We become our very own idol. Sometimes we think like that, isn't it? When we accomplish things and we come ahead, you know, we've been here and you say, you know, it's my blood, sweat and, you know, tears that brought me here. It is my hard work that has brought me to where I am. God does not get glory in that. Why? Because you're saying it's through your strength and your trial. You went through many difficulties and you came through and you know you came through like this. But if God didn't give you that air to breathe in the morning when you wake up, if God didn't get you to get off that bed, what if he stopped all your muscles from working? No, you wouldn't have been able to, there would have been no blood, there would have been no sweat, there would have been no tears. It's only because of God. That's why sometimes God just Let's us come to a point where we say we need you, God. That without him we cannot do anything. And God loves to do things that are way over the earthly standards of things. When earth cannot measure what God can do. Because that's how great God is. You have to understand. He is almighty God. He is El Shaddai. If, see, before God made a covenant with Abraham, he asked Abraham to do something. What did he see? In, in verse 1, it talks about, walk before me and be blameless. A very tough thing. 
See, God asked Abraham to walk before him and be blameless. In other words, God wanted Abraham to be what? To be obedient and to have an untamed character. God is all about building character in people. Character is a very most important thing. I've, I've talked about it a lot of times, even in my sermons when I've preached. I've always, I'm very hard on, on people's character. Because I believe that is the greatest thing that we need to work at. That we have to prioritize that. That is something we all have to prioritize. Building our character. See, the word blameless does not only mean to have a faultless character. No. It means whole. Blameless means whole. God wanted all of Abraham, not just parts of him. He wanted total commitment from Abraham's part. See, sometimes we allow God, when we want God to work in our life, there are certain areas we don't want to give God. Lord, this part of my life, you don't have anything to do with it. This is my part of my life. Do we have certain areas that only we give God? You know, my workplace and my work life, Lord, don't get involved in any of that. I can manage all that and I'm handling it very well. I'm balancing it very well. So, Lord, please don't, don't, don't put your two cents into this. Or it may be your family, the relationship you have. Maybe you have a relationship with a the, with the, with the non-believer and you're saying, you know, Lord, just don't, 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 don't talk to me about that. That's none of your business, Lord. I'm handling it well. I'm balancing it well. But everything else you want God to do for you, but that you don't want to give to God. That, that, that you can handle. You know better than God. Are we like that sometimes? We all have that. We all have that flaws. You know, I've had it many times. Where where there are certain things I give God. Certain things I say, Lord, don't, don't put your hand into this. And you know, he's such a loving, decent God that when you say don't, he won't. He'll just step back. But what he desires is to have all of you. Everything. That's what he wanted from Abraham. See, he is almighty God. And if we are to see his mighty power at work in our lives, then we cannot give him bits and pieces of ourselves. It's all or nothing. See, committing ourselves completely to God and giving ourselves wholly to him is the most beautiful act of worship. Since we are on the study of true worship, what is true worship? Giving our all is an act of true worship to God. See, with looking at, just looking at what I shared with you, you so how do we need to prepare ourselves when waiting for God to answer our prayer? What do you think that this preparation is? And do you think that preparation for God to answer your prayer is an act of worship? These are just questions I'm throwing at you. See, number one, we have to be first willing and obedient to do whatever God commands us to do or not to do. If he says us not to do this, then we have to fully obey him. See, there may be certain times God will ask us, you know, do this. Put this right. But if we say no, I am happy like this. Things are okay. And if we rebel and we refuse to be obedient, we end up creating our own witchcraft. Ooh, really? Yes. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. What does the word of God say? First Samuel, let's keep your, keep your hand on, on Genesis and let's go to First Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. What does it say? For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Oh, yes. So, can we have another version when maybe, maybe NIV? We say what what NIV says. Fifteen 
15, 1 Samuel 15 verse 23. Yeah, so for rebellion is like the sin of divination, which is witchcraft. And arrogance, that is being stubborn and arrogant, like evil of idolatry. So this verse actually states that rebellion, what is rebellion? Refusing to obey is the same as witchcraft. And stubbornness, that is hardness, saying no, is same as idolatry. So when we reject the word and commandments of God, he too will reject us from experiencing the miracle we need. When we are stubborn and say, no, this is my way of doing it. God, you better like it. I don't. And if you're very, when God asks you to, gives you a time frame and says, you know what? You want this miracle. You've been praying for this. While praying, God says, I need you to put this and this right. And you're like, no, I'm not going to put that right. I just need the miracle to happen. We are being stubborn and disobedient. And then we question God saying, Lord, why hasn't my miracle happened? I have been praying God, but why isn't it, why, why isn't it, taking, why is it taking so long? Why is nothing happening? God is trying to show you something and he's trying to put something right. And if you're not obedient enough to obey that, then you cannot call yourself a true worshipper. So secondly, we also need to maintain a godly character. So this, all this is talking about with, uh, you know, how we waiting, preparation, waiting. When we pray and ask God for something, or when God promises us something, when God gives us a promise, how are we supposed to wait for it? Number one, like I said, we have to be willing to do whatever God tells us to do during that waiting period. Secondly, we need to maintain a godly character. When waiting for an answer to prayer, this preparation becomes an act of worship. How? Romans 12, verse 1. Let's look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It says it beautifully. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Key words in this verse. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice. I want you to mark these little words. And what is, what is the them he's talking about? Your bodies. He's talking about your bodies. A living and holy sacrifice. The other key word I want you to mark is the kind he will find acceptable. He will find acceptable, not you finding acceptable. Not you or your, the, the, the man of God finding, no, this is okay. No, that he finds acceptable. This is a truly, this is truly the way to worship him. See, so our bodies, we have to offer it as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God. This is our true and proper worship to God. What is true worship? Putting our bodies as a living sacrifice to him, the way he accepts it. Not to satisfy our acceptation, but to satisfy God's expectation of us. That is the tough one. Because that is a true act of worship to God. So let's look at verse 2. What did God promise to what did God promise Abraham? And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. So first God cuts covenant with Abraham. God had not forgotten the promise he did make to Abram 25 years ago. He made a promise that he will make him a great nation. Didn't he? When he asked him to leave and go, he said, I will make you a great nation. He didn't forget that. 
So this proves the credibility of El Shaddai. He is a God who keeps his word. Right? So he will keep his word. So secondly, firstly what? So one, number one, he hadn't forgotten about the covenant he made. Secondly, God said that he would multiply Abram exceedingly. In other words, Abram would have many descendants. See, have, has God given you a promise? Maybe while you were praying and asking God for something, maybe in your time when you were really in a struggle and you were really in your knees and you were praying and asking God and then God gives you a word, He gives you a promise that He's going to do this with you or He's going to bless you like this manner. You may have forgotten about it, but God has not forgotten about it. He will definitely bring it to past. Things may not seem as it looks like it is, but He will definitely because He is El Shaddai. He is a covenant keeping God. He never goes back on his word. See, look at Abraham. He was, what, 99 years old. See, you may be advanced in years and have done all that you need to do for your family. You may have worked hard, earned, given your daughters in marriage, your son in marriage, and you've done all what you need to do. They cannot say they lack anything. And you may be like, you know, I have nothing to look forward to. What do you think? Are you saying to God, you know, there is nothing much I can do now. The best years of my life are well spent. Are you, are you, are you, do you have that mindset? Or are you telling God, Lord, this is the season that God can start something new in and through me. Is your mindset like that? Or you sing, you know, Lord, I don't, want to, I don't want you to use me, God, because you know what, I, I am old, I'm, I have grey hair, uh, you know, you should have used me when I was young. Then I would have been able to achieve great things. Is that the mindset you are in? See, God will use us whenever we ask Him to use us. He doesn't force Himself. We have to be open and say, Lord, use me. That is it. Lord, I am here available to do whatever you want me to do. In my young life, in my old life, age, I, again I'm saying you, in God's eyes, age is not a problem at all. Timing, God's timing is different. If he was able to do something amazing with Abraham at 99 years old, I am definitely sure he can do something amazing with you. It's our mindset. Will you have that say, Lord, this is the season, God. God, you can start something new in me and through me. I am ready, God. Are you ready? You have to be ready. You've got to say, Lord, I am ready. Tell me, what can I do? God will give you, God will use you mightily because there is nothing that is impossible with God. See, the Hebrew word for covenant is Brit meaning a pact or a treaty or a contract. So what does it mean to make a covenant with God? So what does it mean to make a covenant with God? Have you made a covenant with God? Think. See, is it to make a sort of vow where both parties promise to fulfill the requirements? Both parties, are not a single party. Both parties have to fulfill the requirements. Or is, it, or is it to make a deal with God where the believer gets the greatest benefits? Sometimes our covenants with God are like that. No? We, it's like a deal we make with God. Where the believer, only one side of the party, gets the greatest benefits. See, having and making a covenant with God it means to establish a close and binding relationship with God that seals your spiritual identity, binds you to a divine mission on earth, which results in divine favor and blessing all your life. Like I always say, God's blessing is never only for you, it's for, it's for your entire generation. 
<coughs> so covenants are very important. Have you made a covenant with God? Think. Go back in time maybe. Maybe you made it a long time ago. Have you kept your side of that covenant? Or are you waiting? You have forgotten about it. God's done what he needs to do. But have you totally forgot what you said you will do? <clears throat> and you're continuing your life as normal. Think about it. Let's go to verse 3 and 4. <coughs> then Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. See, covenants are very serious things in the eyes of God. See, the five most important covenants in the Bible are Number one, the covenant he made with Noah, the Noahic covenant. Then the covenant he made with Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant. The covenant he made with Moses, the Mosaic covenant. The covenant he <coughs> made with David. And the new covenant. How did Abraham respond to the presence of El Shaddai when he wanted to make a covenant with God? What did he do? Did Abraham sit down and take a pen and a paper, a quill? Okay, they didn't have a pen, they had a quill. And he took a papyrus paper and he started, okay, let's get ready to write the agreement. <coughs> did, uh, did Abraham ask Sarah and his servants to be present as witnesses? To make sure each one holds what they tell? Or did Abraham just refuse to get into a covenant with God? Until he had answered the prayers <coughs> and granted all his requests. Did Abraham say, no, Lord, first sort out all my issues, then I will sit and do a covenant with you. First settle me. No, he didn't do any of that. What did Abraham do? First and foremost, in all humility, he fell face down in worship before God. He fell prostrate, face down in worship before God. See, this is such a beautiful way to respond to God. It's a way we respond to El Shaddai. God Almighty makes a covenant with us or gives us a promise concerning our future our family, our work. God may give you that promise in your prayer time or while you're reading the word. Suddenly God gives you this promise for your work, for your family, for, your, for you personally. Instead of what do we do? Oh, thank you, Lord. It would be beautiful if we just fall flat on face down and worship God in appreciation of his goodness. It's a true act of worship. In all humility. Why? <coughs> to say thank you. So in this, what was the covenant? Uh, we, we can see in this. God said, I will make you a father to many nations. And still he is 99 without children. And God's promise is, I will make you a father to many nations. Does Abraham question God that very moment? No. He just fell flat and worshipped him. What a beautiful understanding Abraham had of God. What a beautiful relationship. For Abraham, time didn't matter. He just loved God. Abraham knew what true worship really is see <clears throat> if you calculate your see the past year or so has there been moments where you've been prostrate fall face down before God in worship see you might think 
you know this present day and age it is not really necessary to do those we worship him with our hearts but you see a, an outward act sh truly shows your heart condition an outward act of that it not only shows because it's done in the private it, no one sees it <coughs> but the angels in heaven see satan and his demons can see that you worship the true god how you love him that is prot portrayed in what you do it's just not our hands and knees that go before him in worship but our entire being lays flat in his awesome almighty presence there are many times you know in my prayer time in my quiet time where i lay just prostrate before god just in awe and i just worship him and i thank him for what he has done in my life so at least once a year i hope you will be able to go prostrate before god and worship him okay let's move time is ticking let's move to verse number 5 no longer shall your name be called abram but your name shall be abraham for i have made you a father of many nations so the first thing god did was he changed his name from abram to abraham which means exalted father see abram means exalted father okay he changed it to abraham and what is abraham's meaning father of many okay he changed it from abram to abraham see the day you received jesus as your personal savior as you when you accepted him you know you may not have undergone a name change and all that but however your name was recorded in heaven as proof that you were willing to make a covenant with god for all eternity so where was your name recorded in the lamb's book of life in revelations 21 27 it talks about that your name is recorded in the lamb's book of life see when we give our lives to christ inwardly something has changed which needs to be portrayed outside as well we will look into that more <clears throat> so let's go to verse 6 and 8 verse 6 to 8 i will make you exceedingly fruitful i will make nations of you and kings shall come from you and i will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be god to you and your descendants after you also i give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger all the land of canaan as an everlasting possession and i will be their god so there are five i will promises contained in the covenant god made with abraham number 1 god will make abraham great in number that's the first i will he says secondly almighty god will cause nations and kings to be birthed by abraham and when we read through we see that is true thirdly The Lord will establish his covenant and make it a foundation for all generations in the future. El Shaddai will be the god of all descendants of Abraham. We still too claim the promise and the blessing of Abraham. Number 4. He will give the entire promised land of Canaan to the descendants of Abraham. as an everlasting possession so this is the nation of israel and lastly el shaddai will be their 
God. See, these five I will stay, uh, promises God gave Abraham thousands of years ago remain unchanged to this day. Every one of these promises of God came to pass. Therefore, why? Pro proving the credibility of God. See, the credibility of a person means the trustworthiness of the person. A person who will keep his word. God did this. He kept his word. He never went back. He never minused one of those I will promises. He kept his word. He kept his promise to Abraham. El Shaddai, with whom nothing is impossible, proved his credibility by bringing it to pass every one of his promises that he made Abraham. When we read through scriptures, we find every one of those promises come to pass. See, in verse 8, if you look at verse 8, see, when God says, I will be their God, Verse 8 talks about saying, I will be their God. Right there at the end. So how does Abraham expect, how does, sorry, how does God expect Abraham descendants to keep the covenant? By expecting them to have many children? By planting vineyards and prospering? Is that his expectation? No. God expects it, what? By acknowledging El Shaddai as their God and worshipping him alone. See, that is why it is very important when we tell our children about the greatness of God. And they tell their children. And it goes down the generation of who Almighty God is. See, we don't only worship him when he answers prayers. Only when he answers a prayer, ah, oh, we worship him. What if when he doesn't answer a prayer? Do you still worship him? Or you wait to worship him only after he answers the prayer? See, a beautiful time, one time God really, the Holy Spirit challenged me. You know, I was going through a difficult time a few years back. And, and God really challenged me and asked. And I was, I was questioning God actually. Lord, do you really love me? If you love me, why am I in this situation? I haven't done anything wrong, Lord. And you know the Holy Spirit beautifully asked me, so how do you judge God's love for you? So I, I, I was saying, you know, when, when, when everything is going good and you know I'm provided for and all that. And oh, oh, so that's the only way you know that God loves you. And it really hit me really hard and I just was so... I felt so bad, I really knelt down and said, Lord, I'm so sorry. That I categorized you, and I categorized your love for me, is only when you, how you bless me. The moment you don't bless me, I feel you don't love me. So that means your love, I only categorize is through blessing. And I learned something that day. Lord, whether you give or you don't, I know you still love me. When I have and when I don't, I still know you love me. That is his love. A lot of people expect and they think God loves them only when everything is going good. The moment everything goes bad, they also turn bad towards God because they think God doesn't love them. Where he is no, we cannot measure God's love in what he gives us and blesses us. His love is different. His love is completely different. Let's go to verse 9. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants, after you throughout their generations. See, when God makes a precious covenant with you, doesn't mean it's only for you. It's for your entire bloodline and generations to come. 
See, it is every covenant God makes. If God has made a promise to you, it's not only for you, it's for your entire generation. See, that is why it is important, like I was saying before, it is very important for us to tell our children about the goodness of God in our lives. How God provided for us. How God did this for us. The moment I was like this, it is good to tell our children of the miracles God did when we didn't have or when we were struggling, when we were going through struggle, either sickness or whatever. We always tell our children about the goodness of God. Because the moment children's mindset start turning to that, that's how we carry that blessing, the promise throughout our bloodline. See, Psalms 143 verse 4. What does it say? I don't think I gave that. Psalms 143 verse 4. Beautiful Psalm, it says, Psalms 143, verse, verse 4. Oh, uh, maybe I've got the thing wrong. It talks about one generation will praise you. One generation shall praise your works to another. Okay, maybe I have missed that one. I'm sorry. Not sure where it talks about. It talks about it in the Psalms. Give me a minute. Mm. Okay. Well, it. I can't find it right now. Uh, but it talks about. There's a verse in Psalms where it says, "One generation shall praise your works to another." And shall declare your mighty acts. So from generation to generation, we need to talk about the works of God in our lives. What God has done in our lives. One generation to another, our works, the God's work, how he has done things in our lives. Okay, Psalms 145 verse 4. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Right? So we need to take down from one generation to another the, the, the goodness, the miracle, the things God has done in our lives. See, when we tell our children and grandchildren about the mighty acts that God has done in our lives, we raise them to recognize the one true God whom they ought to worship. Not Dada, not Mama, but it was only through God that we are here today. So we got to point our children and our grandchildren to worship the true God. Okay, let's go to verse 10 to 11. This is my covenant with you, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of of the covenant between me and you. So there was a physical sign here that God had to make a covenant with Abraham. What was that physical sign? Circumcision. God wanted Abraham and every male child in his household to circumcise the foreskin of the flesh. This was a physical sign that God had made a covenant with Abraham so that he would be a father of many. So in the Old Testament, God cut covenant with his people by commanding them to circumcise. See, circumcision was a sign of being in a covenant relationship with God in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, what did God change? Circumcision to in order to show that he was in a covenant relationship with his people. Colossians 2 11 to 12. Colossians chapter 2 verses 11 to 12 tells us what God did in the New Testament. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Christ 
performed a spiritual circumcision by cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with him you were raised in new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. So the New Testament circumcision was changed to what? Water baptism. See, the Old Testament circumcision where God had a covenant relationship with his people. That was the only way he knew there was a covenant relationship with his people. In the New Testament, that covenant relationship is through the, the waters of baptism. So, therefore, see, some of Christians believe, you know, just because they have given their lives to Christ and, you know, they need to be a part of the Abrahamic account, they go and circumcise themselves. No, that is not correct. Christians don't need to be circumcised, but they need to be baptized. Right? So, baptism is a very important thing. In a Christian person's life. If you have given your life to Christ. Then I would, all, uh, I would encourage you to get baptized. To seal that covenant relationship with God. Right? And at church I know at the father's house we do baptism. So please speak to Dilrukshi or Marisa. And give in your name to get baptized. It is an important thing to cut covenant with God. Right? See, if cutting covenant with God is an act of worship, then do you agree that baptism demonstrates true worship as a result of obedience? I'll ask that question again. If cutting covenant with God is an act of worship, then do you agree that baptism demonstrates true worship as a result of obedience? Yes, baptism is an act of worship resulting in pure obedience. Because when we come into a covenant relationship with God, that seals our salvation. So, if you look at it, everything about true worship is obedience. Worship has everything to do with obedience. See, if you have cut covenant with God in the waters of baptism, then do you believe that El Shaddai, who is a covenant-keeping God, is able to fulfill his promises to you? Or do you doubt his word? We want God to do everything for us, but we fail to obey him in what he has asked us to do. I always say, delayed obedience is disobedience. You can delay to obey it. That is like disobeying. That is like being stubborn. And rebellious. That is what disobedience is. So think. I want you to take a moment and really think on the number of times which you would have doubted God's promise over your life and your family. Have you ever wondered why God doesn't seem to be answering our prayers? Take a few moments and then think. What have you done in your part to safeguard that covenant relationship with Him? If you truly are in a covenant relationship with Him, have you fulfilled your divine mission on earth? Or at least work towards it? Have you done your part? Have you made a covenant with God? Maybe you prayed and asked God, Lord, heal me. And I will serve you the rest of my life, Lord. And God actually healed you. And you are nowhere to be seen to be serving God. Maybe you said, Lord, give me a child. And I will, I will offer him to you as my firstborn to serve you and do this. And maybe God answered and gave you a child. 
And instead of pushing him or her to serve God, you are pushing him to go to this university, go to that university, go to this country. God kept his side of his covenant, his promise. But have you kept your side of the covenant? Maybe you ask God, Lord, take me to this nation. Do this for me or do this for me, Lord, and I will do this. We have to be very careful in our times of prayer and in our times of thing, heart, what we tell God that we will do if we are unable to keep it. Maybe you're sitting and watching this and you know it's really speaking to you. Maybe it's bringing back to your memory a promise that you made God. God kept his side of it. But you totally forgot about what you need to do. God is asking you to put it right, right now. Or maybe God's given you a promise and you've not seen anything come to pass yet. But have you, how have you waited in that preparation time? Has God asked you to do little things and have you disobeyed him? Have you said, no, until you bless me, I'm not going to do any of these things. Until you make that miracle in my life, I am not going to do any of these things. Are you being rebellious like that? We need to question and ask ourselves. So as we come to a close. See, I wanted to ask, if you feel there have been times where you have doubted the credibility of the covenant keeping God and made decisions of your own instead of waiting for him to keep his word. Then it would be best to fall face down and ask God for his forgiveness. Having done that, bow down before him and declare that he is your El Shaddai and that you believe in his word. Maybe God gave you a promise that he said he will do this and he hasn't still and you try to do it in your own strength. You try to make it happen instead of waiting on God's timing. Maybe you're a mother who's watching and you're praying and asking a partner for your daughter. And God said, yes, he will give you a partner. But don't go outside of God's timing. You can mess it up completely. And then don't sit and blame God. Maybe you're praying and asking God to open a job opportunity. And instead of waiting on his timing, you do things your way, bring in things and do things. And then when it all messes up, you blame God and walk away from God, say, God didn't keep to his promise. No. You made the mistake. You went outside of God's timing and did it your way instead of waiting for God to do it his way. He is El Shaddai. He is a promise-keeping God. He will do it. If he doesn't do it now, he will do it. But how do we wait in our transit period when we prepare for that answer to come? The waiting period is the most important time. And you will see the moment you start waiting in the proper manner, you will see God because you have to have that faith. He is a trustworthy God. Today we are studying about El Shaddai, the credibility of God. He will bring it to pass. I am here to confirm it. I have seen it happen in my life. Waiting for his timing is always perfect. So I would like uh, you all to do something if you, if you are willing, you know, you can, it doesn't, it's not uh, compulsory, but it's not right. 
If you have some olive oil with you, you have a little bottle of olive oil, we'd love you to grab that olive oil. And you know, I want you to take it, take some oil on your finger. Put the sign of the cross on your forehead and lay your hands on your head and ask God to fill you anew with his Holy Spirit. Ask the Lord to bless you in every area of your life so that he may establish his covenant with you and use you for his glory. You're going to pray over yourself today. You're going to anoint yourself. You don't need anyone to do that. You are the greatest prophet for you. You are the greatest anointed servant for you right now. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 18. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 18. Remember the Lord your God. He is the one. Who? He is the one who gives you power to be successful in order to fulfill the covenant he confirmed to your ancestors with an oath. We stand here as the generation from Abraham. We claim his blessings on us. What he promised Abraham will happen to us. Because God said it is, a gener it is a blessing from generation to generation. Do you believe you are a generation of Abraham? If you believe that, then I want you to pray and ask the Holy Spirit. Put the sign of the cross on your forehead. Lay your hands and pray and ask God to renew that Holy Spirit in you. Let him bless you in every area of your life. Take Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 18 and say, Lord, the way and the promise you cut covenant with Abraham. Bring to remembrance the verses which God spoke over Abraham and claim it over your life. And see things change. Before we go into a time of worship, and uh, there will be a song that will be played, and as you go into that time of worship, before that, let us pray together. The prayer will come up on your screens, and I want you to you pray that prayer with me. If you want to kneel down, I would like you to kneel down. If you can, if you are able to kneel down, kneel down. We're going to claim this over our lives. Let's pray. El Shaddai, the covenant-keeping God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Blessed be your holy name. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things. Plans formed of old, faithful and sure. O oh Lord my God, you are not man that you should lie, or a son of man that you should change your mind. You are the God who keeps your word. What you have spoken, you will fulfill. I worship you, for you have established your covenant with me, and all your promises to me are yes and amen. I know therefore that El Shaddai, the Almighty God, is the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generation. Because of your great love, we are not consumed, for your compassions never fail. They are new every morning, Great is your faithfulness. I bow down and worship you, for you are worthy. Hallelujah. All praise and glory be unto you, my Lord, for you are from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. As you have said that prayer, and as you have declared that he is El Shaddai, as we go into this time of worship, 
I want you to bring back to remembrance every promise God has made you. And I want to reignite your faith to believe that God is coming through. He is a covenant keeping God. Do not lose hope. Do not give up. You can trust him. He is trustworthy. What he says he will do. He will bring that promise to pass. I declare that in the mighty name of Jesus. Whatever God has promised you and your family. He is going to bring it to pass. He is El Shaddai. And I will catch you again next week. As we continue our studies on true worship. Be blessed.
this King of glory, Jesus is his name. Oh, hail the King of glory, forever he shall reign. He came and redeemed my story. Everything has changed. Oh, hail the King of glory. This is a song.